Same old friends here. This is a wonderful audience. Uh, no students today? Oh, two. Okay. Great. I wish we had more students because the, the questions from the students are always interesting. On the other hand, the questions from you guys are great. And I'm, I'm very happy with, with what we did a couple of weeks ago. Um, I was, uh, since you mentioned uh, passwords and time sharing and stuff like that, uh, the uh, uh, Corbato Memorial event on Monday afternoon and evening was wonderful, really extraordinary. Uh, everybody from the old uh, Multics days who's still alive uh, was there, and a lot of other folks that uh, have been fighting this battle for so many years. That'll be good. That's good. Um, so what I want to do today is uh, give uh, two talks uh, that are completely different from what, what you heard uh, three weeks ago. Uh, the first one, the thunderclap talk, is, is really uh, um, largely due to uh, Theo uh, in Cambridge. And uh, I would point out that, <clears throat> that this talk and the, other, the second half of it are funded by DARPA. And a little bit of uh, the UK, which um, Theo managed to get a little grant from the, uh, the British government. And uh, there's a pieces of under uh, additional uh, funding for, for students, for example. We have three or four students funded by Google or ARM or um, Microsoft or whatever in Cambridge. And I've got a, a, a wonderful team of folks in Cambridge who are really the ones who are driving all of this, the, the thunderclap stuff and the hardware stuff. Uh, and what I may have a little bit of time to talk about is uh, what Cherry, our hardware architecture, can do uh, for Thunderclap. I can't get into that uh, at the moment because it, there's a lot of stuff that's uh, in flux. And that part of the project is, is protected by uh, controlled unclassified information, which is annoying. So we have to get slides approved, and we have to get papers approved, and all that stuff. Um, I'm, I'm going to. Uh, ramble through a lot of the, um, the thunderclap issues. Uh, as, as you suggested, um, you've got a, a dongle that you stick into your, which your, uh, into your laptop, which purports to be a charger. It's going to charge your, your battery for you. How do you know? Do you have any idea what the hell you're sticking into your laptop? And as you will see, the answer is you don't have a clue. So let us get into that. Uh, the standard here is pluggable peripherals, uh, docking stations, uh, uh, things that used to be way inside, they're now outside. Uh, you've got folks uh, building systems where the device drivers are uh, in user space, like um, SEL4. You've got stuff that uh, uh, typically um, in your laptops and your cell phones, there are uh, something like two dozen devices, microcontrollers, clocks, whatever, uh, most of which have direct memory access to your uh, main processors. And those are all proprietary. They're undocumented. You have absolutely no idea what the hell is going on. So this is the problem that we're going to be uh, looking at. Um, uh, Theo asked, what can an adversary do? And, and the answer is just about anything. Um, uh, per peripherals are more weakly defended than the main system. Um, and they are springboards to further attacks. And they give the, uh, the users and the system administrators the opportunity to do all sorts of horrible things that they don't realize they're doing. And uh, of course, exfiltration and all that. Uh, and uh, supply chain, where you really don't know what you're getting, whether these microcontrollers that are embedded in your laptops and cell phones are, in fact, um, doing something malicious. So um, the, the fundamental uh, problem is one that we spent, uh, about, we spent about four years playing with this. And I'll give you a quick rundown on what happened. Um, I think four, maybe five years ago, yes, we got a, um, a little seedling from DARPA to study this problem of what, what, what does it look like inside. And we, we, we did some uh, digging, and we found these, these uh, 
a dozen or two dozen microcontrollers, and we found all kinds of stuff uh, deeply inside. Um, I'm not going to talk about Galbimignan, but, but the Google Project Zero, which started around, what, four years ago maybe, um, discovered one of the things that, that uh, uh, was particular to a Wi-Fi microcontroller. And uh, all of these slides are online, so you'll, you'll have access to that. Um, I'm not going to talk so much about his work, but more about ours. And so we started out just looking at this thing. And then along came the second project um, from the MTO part of DARPA. And what they asked for was uh, they want a RISC-V uh, cherry and they want a, uh, a possibility of an arm cherry of some sort. Uh, we were already doing some arm cherry stuff uh, for 64-bit for in, uh, in the first project. And uh, there's something that I can't talk about, which is a a non-specification of a non-prototype uh, that ARM is looking at. And that's, that's about all I can say about that one for a 32-bit uh, um, cherry ARM. Um, the human factors are enormous. There's a huge disconnect between the thing that it looks like a charger and is, in fact, something completely different. Uh, there's, there's just a lot of confusion here. And the thing we want to get into is the so-called IOMMU, which is trying to do for IO what the MMU is doing for memory. And we started out looking at IOMUs and uh, from the peripheral point of view uh, rather than the microcontroller embedded. And um, we found um, that each peripheral uh, has uh, potentially an enormous amount of uh, potential access. So we started telling uh, Microsoft about this uh, three years ago. Their first reaction was, uh, this is not in our business model. Uh, it's not a problem. Uh, a year later, we gave them the revised paper that uh, actually showed uh, what their problems were. In Windows 7 and 8, there is no IOMMU. Um, and Windows 10 Home, uh, there wasn't one in the early stages. Um, and in Windows 10 Enterprise, there is one, but it's not uh, enabled by default. And in Home Pro, and uh, later on uh, 1803 and beyond, uh, there is a little bit of kernel protection. And in fact, they, they responded to what we had told them, and they did make some changes, and, and you'll see that in a moment. Um, we, we told Mac that they had a problem, and we showed them what it was, and they uh, ran out and they got to 10.8.2 to of uh, iOS, and that, in fact, solved one of the problems. Uh, there's still a bunch that, uh, that haven't been resolved yet. Uh, but we were very diligent in, in telling everybody about what their problems were and, and giving them a lot of time to respond. So in three iterations of the paper, we finally got it accepted. The first two times we submitted it, the referee said, one referee said, this is a fantastic paper. It's breaking all kinds of new ground. The other two referees said, I don't understand this stuff at all. I, I don't know anything about this. But I'm an expert in the area, so I'm going to reject this paper. Um, so we, the third time around, we actually got the paper accepted. And that's the paper that, that, that I'm basically presenting Theo's slides on. Uh, Linux um, IOMMU was not enabled by default. Um, after 4.2.1, uh, it's enabled for Thunderbolt devices, um, but not uh, PCI, yeah, other, other, other kinds of devices. And uh, the mappings, in fact, are specific to a device. So for FreeBSD, it's, again, not enabled by default. Um, and um, there is no, there's no Thunderbolt hot plug. Only devices attached at power on are enabled, which is a little bit of a help. This means somebody can't walk up to your processor and stick in the, the, the nasty uh, thing. Okay, now what we've done is we've actually built a thing called Thunderclap, which is that device that you plug into a USB-C port and um, it pretty much takes over the system. 
Um, if, uh, if you worry about uh, the internals of, of the microcontrollers, uh, I will again talk a little bit about that, but not enough. But the, the basic attitude there is we're going to put a capability-based interposer, which will work dandy in a cherry system, which we'll talk about in the second half of the talk. Um, and that that might, in fact, mediate all of these uh, otherwise unrestricted DMA accesses. Now, I want to make one point. Um, a lot of uh, Theo, in fact, thought that this was a, a new problem. Um, and I pointed out, no, no, we recognized that in Multics in 1965 because the GIOC was a uh, coprocessor for input-output, and it had basically the potential of total access to all memory. But it was configured in such a way that uh, it was hard, hard, well, not hardwired, but it was programmed in a way that was very difficult to change uh, into certain registers that you could share with uh, absolute addresses rather than with virtual addresses. And so we recognized, I, I, I was part of the Multics thing in 65, and uh, it was clear that this was a problem. And it was clear that we were not going to address it in a, uh, a system uh, that was designed for um, uh, a computer center that had uh, locked doors and, and no access to uh, to the processors. So you're not going to get in and reprogram the GIOC, and it was it was not uh, accessible uh, uh, on the internet because there was no internet. I'm reminded of the story of, of Robert Morris and, and the internet worm. Uh, where Microsoft said, gee, we're so good uh, that, that this never bothered us. Of course, it was only going at, uh, <laughs> at a particular Linux operating system. So they were immune without uh, thinking about it. So that was a funny statement from Microsoft saying, oh, yeah. Well, then they also discovered the Internet, but that was another thing. Um, so here we have this, this platform. Um, I'm not going to go into the hardware and the software in any great detail, but it's basically uh, FPGA attached. It, it's attached by a PCIe uh, to the, uh, the, the port. And so the idea is that uh, it presents the Thunderclap device as a real functional PCIe device. And it is plausible enough to allow driver attachment. It's, it's perfectly capable of performing all of the correct interactions with the IOMMU to open windows, send and receive packets, and so on. And um, the, the bottom line there is that it is a Turing machine, basically, that has access to, uh, to pretty much everything in your system. Um, there are a bunch of versions of it. Uh, the current version is uh, an ARIA 10 with hard ARM core running Ubuntu. Uh, it, it iterated, as you can see, through uh, various versions, and, and this is the current version. Um, the um, board looks like this, and that's the Intel uh, ARIA 10 SOC development kit. And then there's the, um, uh, the boards, and I, I don't want to get into that because that will uh, take up too much time because I want to get, uh, um, I do have a clock here, that's good. Um, okay, hardware miscellaneous. this is uh, Theo being Theo, talking about docs and OS images and, and the, the, the fiddling around with the cards and all that stuff. And the basics, packet switch interconnect, tree structure using switches, transport layer packets. Um, <clears throat> both ends are generating TLPs. It's bidirectional. And uh, the self-description discovery via configuration registers stored on the device. So it's basically probing and figuring out what's going on and, and uh, taking advantage of it. Um, the, uh, the interface, um, let's see, uh, I think you can read that slide faster than I can speak it. And then TLP generation, and finally a, a Kimu code base uh, for 
emulating it and figuring out what's happening. Uh, major, major surgery to strip out the majority of chemo to, to get this to work cleanly. And uh, then Theo dug into the uh, TLP handling. Okay, so as far as the internal networking is going on, the back end is slurp, and uh, he says uh, we could have plumbed fake, a fake nick through the real nick on arm, uh, but it wasn't even needed for the attacks that we were creating, uh, so it was gratuitous. Uh, weaponizing chemo and uh, fun with thunderclap. Uh, Theo was having a ball for a couple of years, or three years, I guess, playing with all this. Um, pointers exposed to Nick due to 4 KB uh, page granularity. You can change the pointer and take control. The same process works for FreeBSD. Um, he's, he's watching the pages exposed to the NIC and is able to dump anything he wants. And uh, this, I think, gives you the idea that this little dongle is uh, a pretty amazing creature. It has some fascinating uh, abilities. So back in 2016, we started talking to Microsoft. I mentioned already um, they announced that Windows 10 1803 will enable the IOM at MU. That doesn't mean they've solved the problem, but it means it will be uh, much better than it has been in the past. Apple fixed the, the vulnerability that we reported to them in 10.12.4, and that was released uh, fairly quickly once we, uh, we showed them the problem. Uh, Linux uh, it says uh, Intel enabled uh, IOMMU for Thunderbolt devices, uh, it's disabled for ATS for Thunderbolt, and um, their security team says it's a hard problem to solve in general. I think that should be obvious to you at this point, that this is a problem that's been around a long time, like buffer overflows and all these other problems that uh, have been around and, and are not uh, solved. There, that one's easier to solve, but uh, this one is, I think... Uh, rather piggy because of all of the, uh, the little uh, foibles that go on. But it's even piggier when you start thinking about the embedded microcontrollers that are, as I say, proprietary, where nobody knows what the hell they're going on and they're not documented and they're just thrown in there, we got a clock and we got this and we got that. And oh, let's put in another microcontroller for, for this function. And uh, if there are two dozen of them, uh, and you try to do a census, uh, you lose before you even begin. So that's uh, the situation there. Uh, we have further engagements with Intel, HP, ARM, Microsoft, and, and others. Apple, uh, Google, interested as well. Um, and yet there's still a lot that we could do. And fortunately, the second project uh, is the one that uh, is funding it now, whereas the first one is the one that started us out. And uh, so I think in his spare time, Theo is continuing to, uh, to play with this. Now, um, he has, uh, it's open sourced, and he's, he, there's a website, uh, .io website, uh, where all of this stuff is up. And uh, he says it's pretty hard to use for somebody who just uh, uh, wants to play around with it. Uh, it takes a while, but he's trying to make it more, uh, um, more usable. Now, conclusions on, on Thunderclap. Um, it's a flexible platform for IO security research and is leading us to new solutions. And in fact, it's leading us to a capability-based uh, solution that uh, we believe will uh, vastly uh, simplify the problem. At present, it needs a skilled operator, as some sharp edges remain. Uh, the published paper uh, is online, and um, the last bullet is interesting. Our work has had considerable real-world impact, including what is noted on slide 25. Um, I added that. And in addition, uh, since uh, he gave the talk, as of early September, uh, we are delighted to report that the new USB standard uh, number four 
is in fact adopting most of the recommendations of the Thunder, uh, Thunderclap paper. So uh, I think DARPA feels. Uh, am I leaving? I'm leaving out a lot. Are they leaving out some crucial ones? Who? Wh who's they? Your people. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. They, they, they're they not solving the problem. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, we are trying to solve the problem. But if you know anything about security, there are no solutions that are guaranteed. So you're doing the best you can. And I think they're going to be doing a lot better uh, with the uh, USB 4. Uh, than they have been in the past. But I think this is a, uh, a very high step that has to be taken to, to get to the next step. It's, it's, a, it's a big leap. Um, and um, the USB 4 is a, a step forward, definitely. Okay, um, let me see what here. Relative, relative background on, on the... Um, uh, cherry mitigation that we're just starting to deal with. Um, as I said, we have support from uh, both uh, M I2O and M2O at DARPA and some British funding. There's a website, th thunderclap.io, which uh, Theo runs. And um, I think we're believing that we can come a long way toward uh, a capability-based uh, solution that, that we're just beginning to uh, firm up and, and specify. And, and uh, It's clearly a hardware-software problem. It's one that you can't solve in hardware alone. You can't solve it in software alone. But you can come much closer if the hardware is supporting it. And we believe we're going to be doing that. Yeah. Your solution will become a higher value target. This is true. Have you taken steps to protect? Well, everything we're doing is open source at this point, uh, except for the connection with ARM. And uh, so I, I would say that um, everything here is dual use. And uh, the uh, foreign nationals are going to pick up on this immediately and say, oh, great, well, now we can break all these systems. Um, our, uh, I'll come to, come to this at the very end, uh, we're actually getting, now getting some real uh, buy-in into tech transfer, so this could, could wind up in your laptops and cell phones in a, in a few years. Yeah, it, it could be anything. It could it could be ASIC. It could be uh, almost anything. It could be a gigantic computer, but you don't need it. So if you were to implement the code in, in hard, hard coded ROM and the SCPA in, in ASIC, would that make the device more um, harder to attack? That is a very interesting argument. I once had a, a contract from NSA. Uh, which was issued in one day. I got the F statement of work in the morning. I sent the proposal in the, that day, and they came back with the contract that afternoon. The challenge of that was to write a report that shows that if it's in hardware, it's more secure, more reliable, more trustworthy uh, than if it's in software. I came up with the opposite conclusion, that that is not true, and I think they were very unhappy. They wanted to believe that, that it, just because you, you have uh, crypto uh, boxes that are built by uh, the agency, well, I, I think uh, the, uh, that was demonstrated by Matt Blaze when he broke the, the clipper chip uh, uh, escrow thing by making a trivial modification to the law enforcement access field. Uh, it, it just blew the whole system out of the water. So I think the, the answer there is um, y you don't want to count your chickens until you have uh, done something with them that uh, I don't want to talk about. Um, I, I think, yes, uh, if you put it in hardware, it's going to be less, uh, uh, less manipulable, unless it's in firmware. Uh, if you put it in software, 
it doesn't stand a chance because the operating systems you're putting it on are fundamentally flawed. And the whole purpose of, of Cherry is to try, well, one of the purposes is to uh, uh, make the use of C and C++ memory safe as a result of the hardware. And if, if you use a memory safe language, then a different set of problems. Uh, but I think the, the answer to that is uh, yes, it should be, this should be done in hardware. And that means a lot of people are going to have to build something into their hardware. Intel has to do some massive changes, I think, to their hardware. Uh, I think ARM has uh, taken a very interesting view on this, and that is that they came back to us and said, you know, you've got this compartmentalization uh, mechanism that I'm going to talk about in a moment. Um, if you use that and you had an identifier for the compartment, you, you have a long leg up on, on solving the DMA problem. So that was a very, very useful uh, observation on, on their part. Um, th this is a slide that you can't read, but the, the essence was we had uh, using FPGAs, which yes, it, it's much faster to get it going. We had a running processor in, in one year on FPGAs, and that enabled us to do all this other stuff. Um, so there's an enormous, I'm not going to go through the slide, but the point is that uh, the, the last, uh, the first two years were really the research platform and the prototype architecture. The second, the, the next two were hybrid model of, of being able to run legacy code in a sandbox and have it not be able to uh, clobber the operating system or the hardware um, and the compartmentalization model. And then in uh, the last, the four years after that, we, we started dealing with the Cherry ABI and, and the, the linker and the, uh, the connection with ARM and uh, for the Cherry ARM, 64-bit. Uh, and uh, in the last two years when we've picked up this other funding from, uh, from the other side of DARPA, um, we're worried about uh, risk five and temporal safety and, and uh, formal proofs. There's another project actually which is f formally proving the correctness of the instruction set architecture with respect to a bunch of capability properties that are fundamental uh, to security or uh, trustworthiness in general. So that's, that's sort of where we've been and where we're going. Um, here's a picture of the, re of the actual um, the, uh, nine years of the Cherry spec, we've just published uh, version seven, which is up on the Cambridge website. It's uh, 300 and whatever pages, I guess it's over 400 in, in, uh, um, in uh, 11 inch pages and, and it's uh, 360 something in uh, uh, British uh, longer pages. Um, it's very detailed and it goes into not only the um, uh, the Cherry MIPS is what we started out with. I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. Um, but also the Cherry uh, ARM 64-bit uh, extension to uh, ARM V8, and, which was done largely by ARM uh, as a prototype just to see if it would work. And uh, we, we gave them a lot of support. And then now the 32-bit and 64-bit Cherry uh, uh, Risk V. So there are different versions. The um, specifications are parameterized, so you can do 32-bit or 64-bit with the same spec, and that's that's helpful. So we're actually proving that these, some of these specs uh, satisfy the basic capability properties of non-forgeability, non-bypassability. Uh, monotonicity, where you can't in any way extend the, the the range of your virtual address space, and you can't change the privileges, you can't increase the privileges, um, and that stuff is is going on in a third project. So we have at the moment three projects. Um, I think I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, the UKRI stuff, which is the the British funding for some additional tech transfer work, which is still under contract, but it looks as if it's going to happen. Um, 
And, and basically, um, we, we've got a, a protection model, we've got the implementation uh, in, uh, in these three different uh, modes of MIPS was the easy one to use because it was open source and we had a specification that somebody had already done for a 32-bit MIPS. And so uh, somebody at Cambridge crafted a 64-bit version of it. And uh, that became the baseline for all of this work in the last nine years. Um, Cherry mitigates vulnerabilities in C and C++. Um, Robert Watson had the, had the view that if we can get rid of all of these memory management problems in C and C++ in hardware, uh, it would be a great thing. And at this uh, British um, uh, UKRI thing, uh, uh, Microsoft actually came out and said, well, 70% of their, uh, their flaws are memory management problems. And this thing seems to solve, uh, this, this architecture seems to solve a lot of them. So that's encouraging. That, that says that we are, uh, we're heading towards something that uh, is useful in the, uh, in the C, plus, C and C++ world. Now the question uh, comes up every now and then, what about if, if you had uh, Rust or, or a memory safe language, uh, why, why would you need Cherry? Uh, well, Cherry does a lot more than, uh, than just the, the memory management stuff. And one of the things that we're doing in the, uh, the second project is the notion of, of trying to uh, remediate a bunch of uh, uh, common weakness uh, examples, exemplars. Um, the uh, the, the MTO, fo MTO folks came up with a bunch of, of classes of, of these things, which they thought would be illustrative. We, if we could show that, that uh, Cherry actually mitigates those in some reasonable way, uh, then um, then it's a it's a win. It, it looks it looks good. Now, it, unfortunately, the the number of of uh, uh, common vulnerabilities is over 130,000 now, and the number of that we're uh, required to mitigate is relatively small. So the question, which is an open question at this point, is what 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 do we do with all this other stuff? What do we what what percentage of the 130,000 open vulnerabilities at the moment can, can this architecture uh, deal with? And we don't know yet. Uh, this is something that we're, we're looking at uh, seriously. Um, the, the compartmentalization mechanism makes good use of the, uh, of the capability hardware. And as I mentioned, you, you can run uh, legacy object code uh, in a sandbox, you can run, um, you can take a, um, a C or C++ program and recompile it and change all of the pointers into capability calls if you want, or some of them. You can annotate the, the source code and say which ones do you want to be capability calls. And then you can partition it into different uh, compartments so that you can solve some of the internal problems. And the compartmentalization is also useful uh, in, a, in a broader scale, not just as a, as a fine grain thing, but as a coarse grain thing, where you are compartmentalizing all the apps on your cell phone or whatever. Uh, each one is, is completely separate from uh, everything else, except in the cases that they have to share. So that's, that's sort of the, the, the basic there. Um, this Cherry enforces protection semantics for pointers, and I mentioned monotonicity and, and permissions and bounds, and, and uh, uh, I didn't mention provenance. Uh, basically, a capability cannot be derived unless it is derived from an existing capability, and the provenance is maintained, so you, you actually keep track of, of the fact that it was derived from a legitimate capability. And you can't fabricate them, you can't forge them, you can't uh, create one out. Yeah? The first time you doubled the pointer size, do you think that's an issue? That's not an issue. We, uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting question. We started out with 256 capabilities. 256-bit 256 256 
capabilities in, in the Cherry MIPS. And uh, some of our, uh, uh, our uh, industrial folks say, eh, it's too big, can't do that. So we have a compression scheme to compress it down to 128-bit capability on a 64-bit machine. And the, the limitations, it turns out, are, are almost negligible. Uh, the, 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 uh, the compression uses something that looks like a floating point uh, representation. And as long as your, your thing is of, of uh, an, uh, appropriate size, and the things are on, the, on even boundaries or, or whatever you have to do, um, that is not a problem. So we, we have played with 64-bit with, uh, capabilities on a 32-bit machine. We can, we can do that as well, and, and we do have some uh, graduate students who are writing theses on the, the variants. Uh, that's one of them. Uh, there's one graduate student at the moment working on uh, on um, uh, uh, use after free and, and things of that nature. And basically we've got about uh, uh, eight, nine PhDs already out of the nine years and, and we've got uh, I think six in the hopper right now at Cambridge. And uh, there are probably 20, 25 people in Cambridge working on, on this uh, with, with the various funding that uh, we have for the three projects. And, and that doesn't count the formal method stuff uh, to prove the properties about the, uh, um, uh, the various uh, variants of, of the cherry architecture. Uh, Peter Sewell at, uh, in Cambridge is the leader of the formal method stuff. And he has his own pile of funding from the British government. Uh, he already had that to, to do a formal specification of the, uh, the ARM version 7. Uh, Arm gave him uh, permission to do that, and uh, he did a, a very interesting job on that. So at that point, uh, Arm version eight is kind of an easy leap forward, and uh, so we're, we're we're playing with with all kinds of different options. And the grad students are having a ball; uh, they're they're amazing, uh, doing absolutely wonderful things. So. I have uh, taken 40 minutes, and um, there's, here's a slide on the compartmentalization uh, where you can have controlled sharing among the different uh, uh, pieces. Um, and then this is the killer slide. It says, here's a lot of problems that we haven't solved yet. Um, this is a nine-year effort thus far. And I don't know, what is the average time of getting stuff into, uh, into production, into real, real hardware? Well, we 10 years, 12 years? What is the worst case? Uh, always double. Uh, always it's double. double. Oh, yeah, 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 right. But the worst case, it never gets in, into, uh, into the world, real world. And this stuff uh, seems to have some uh, serious potential for that at the moment. But yet, there are all these things uh, that, that uh, f like formal proofs of software properties. Can we prove that the, cap the LL, Cherry LLVM, which understands the hardware and uses the capabilities uh, when you compile a pointer and it converts it into a capability, it uses that very constructively. Uh, can we start to prove things um, from the hardware up to the, the kernel and, and up into the compiler and, and uh, so on. Uh, that's all something that uh, we'd like to do in the future. So I see maybe there's another five, 10 years of, of research here. If, uh, we'll yeah, we'll see. I have no idea. Um, the, the, there's a great deal of work on the debugger. Uh, there's even work on a uh, debugger for, uh, for RISC-V on the, on the uh, actual platform. Um, and uh, one of my guys is writing a specification for that. Um, they were involved with the RISC-V community. And um, uh, we have a formal specification of, of the RISC-V baseline. And we have a formal specification of the, RISC, the Cherry RISC-V. And 
and uh, that's the, what what uh, Peter Sewell was using to to prove properties about that. And uh, on and on and on. Um, uh, let's see, is there anything else there that uh, is worth talking about? Um, compartmentalization. We, one of the grad students uh, eight years ago built a little tool for uh, helping you in your compiling of how do you partition up something in such a way that, uh, oh, I didn't turn mine off either. Um, and uh, that is a tool that we've got to come back to and figure out how do we help uh, programmers, system programmers, uh, take the, the optimal advantage of, uh, of the compartmentalization. Uh, that's a tricky, tricky problem. But the, the tool is called SOAP, S-O-O-A-P, uh, S-O-A-A-P, sorry. Um, and that was a lovely piece of work. Uh, I think Robert and, and uh, some other folks have, have been trying to use it in other projects. And, and uh, there was a thing called Tesla, which is a, um, uh, a real-time uh, uh, little, little sequential machine that's looking for bad things. Uh, inside the hardware, and uh, that is a, is a, another uh, avenue where uh, uh, I guess Robert has a um, uh, another DARPA project that is actually using that constructively. Um, so there there are a lot of potential spin-offs here that that look like they're worth pursuing. And the, the, beta, the basic question is, is, is this really uh, going to happen? Um, the, um, the slide I don't have. Um, talks about the, um, the UKRI effort, which you, some of you may have read about in the press. Uh, the EE Times had an article and the register had an article, and this was the um, um, the notion that uh, the British government decided to pony up some real uh, big euros. I'm sorry, big uh, uh, pounds. Did I say euros? That's weird. With Brexit going on, um, uh, <laughs> yeah, um, and then that there's matching funds from industry and and. Uh, Microsoft and ARM and, and a bunch of other folks are are interested in all that. So there's there's some real effort at the moment uh, that looks as if it's going to happen uh, that might help bring all this to in the real world. So let me stop at that point and, and see if I can get some questions out of you guys that uh, that are worth answering. Now let, let me get you on mic this time. Uh, last time and even this time, we didn't get on, on the mic in there. Um, and it's not fair to anybody who's out there. And uh, <coughs> uh, it's hard. I, it's better if you talk. It. Uh, it helps with the time. So, in your list of projects, I didn't see anything about user interface. My experience with capability systems is. The underneath can be real secure, but it can be too easy to give away too much authority unless the UI is good. Very ABI. I said UI, not ABI. Uh -huh. yeah. The ABI is, is, in a sense, a, a, uh, an answer to that in the sense that you're, you're building a, an environment that makes it look like bare hardware, and you're dealing with it in a higher level. Well, I meant something like uh, inadvertently sharing a file read-write when you meant oh, to share a read-only. That's a UI issue. Yeah, yeah. We're back to the um, confused deputy problem, well, for it's example. A, it's, a, it's a confusing UI. Um, yeah. I, I'll give you an example. Mark Stigler um, developed this concept, WYSIWYSH. What you see is what you share. So if you're viewing a file... Uh, read write and you share it, it gets shared read write. And if you're viewing the file read only, it gets viewed read, it gets shared read only. Very clever, and I got it wrong about half the time. So that's an example of needing research on the UI level. We, we do have the example that you can't read and write, yeah, or read, read and execute, basically. Yeah. This is read and write, not read and execute. But I wanted to, fa I wanted to share a file with you 
where you could send me your comments, but you couldn't edit the file directly. And I would inadvertently share it with you where you could. So that. But I need a way to express that policy. And that's, exact, and that's what I'm talking about you. That's a, that's a graduate student's problem at the moment. No, it's a, it's a good, well, yeah, it should be on that list. You're right. Okay, we forgot about that one. Um, who else? Um, you had a problem with uh, IONMU stuff that there's a pointer and a block or something. That looked like a simple software problem. What am I missing? Well, um, let me start from the bottom up. What you're missing is the fact that there are 24 microcontrollers, all of which have direct memory access, basically uncontrolled. Okay, how do you how do you manage that? How do you prevent them from taking over your entire system? How do you prevent the Chinese from putting a Trojan horse in one of the little widget microcontrollers that that um, that everybody's going to put into their computer? because it's the cheapest one and, and uh, it seems like everybody said, oh, it's wonderful, you should use it. Um, this is not a software problem, this is a hardware problem. Am I missing the point? Um, yeah, I was trying to solve the, the plug it in problem as compared to the build it in. Well, uh, yeah, there's, it's the same problem in, in a sense whether you plug it in or whether it's already there, it's the same problem. It's still a direct memory access that is uncontrolled. Doesn't that, doesn't that make sense? I thought there was an IONMU that was a control. Yeah, but it doesn't work. <laughs> now, if you had a better IOMMU, you still can't solve the problem for, for the embedded microcontrollers. That's not its purpose. Yeah. Uh, for some practical systems that you've made, what are the overheads? Good question. What is the overhead? Uh, most of the capability stuff is 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 two percent, roughly. There's some worst cases, occasional root rest worst cases that get up a little bit more, but it's not noticeable. And if it's a simple processor and uh, it's not as complicated as as an Intel processor and you don't have to worry about speculative execution and things of that nature uh, as much, but you still have to worry about them. This is one, that's one of the things we have written and report on. Um, the overhead is, uh, of the compartmentalization is not cons uh, significant. Um, each paper that is written, we got about 40 papers in the, in the uh, nine years, um, it deals with what is the overhead of the particular piece of the mechanism that, that you're talking about. And it varies, but, but in, 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 on average, it's something on the order of 2%. And I would think if, uh, if we're dealing with uh, um, new hardware in a couple of years, it's going to be a lot faster than, uh, well, Moore's Law. Get, get back to that again. We've talked about that here many times. Um, other questions? Yeah, okay. So if I'm compiling a C program down to a capability instruction set, um, can that be done without full program analysis? Can you do it file by file? It would seem that there would be ways to do pointer arithmetic within one file that would look like integer. So do you need the full, um, full program analysis? First of all, you've, you've got um, typed hardware in the sense that hardware supports ob yes. typed objects. Yes, but the problem is that the, um, you know, I'm, I'm doing some arithmetic. I'm doing some arithmetic on an int in one function, mm -hmm. and I return it to another function then then you, that then uses it as a pointer, yeah. right? So that arithmetic could violate the, the cap- The capability stuff. Yeah, works. yeah, oh, okay. But that, you, you can't do that. Okay. And that, that, that is, that that is okay, that's prevented. Okay. Good, good question. I'm sorry, I misinterpreted it. Um, other questions over here? Yeah. Go back to the Hong question. Um, 
some combination of our friends at Shenzhen and DEF CON put the relevant controller into a thing that looks an awful lot like a USB plug. Mm -hmm. So it's already out there ready to, in, to build into whatever peripheral device you want with a USB thing, so. Yeah, there is, there it's, is it's just access to the I.O. bus, that's the problem. From something you think is a charger or a microphone or headphones or something else um, that once we give it access to the I.O. bus, that all bets are off. This is really simplistic based on year 2000 or so knowledge of, of the technology, but <coughs> uh, when the device is identified, uh, can't an appropriately small portion of the address space be allocated to it without causing a, uh, uh, a bus timeout? Yeah, we, did, we did that in, in the GIOC in Publix in 1965. That was hard, it was, uh, as I said, it was programmed into the GIOC that it only had access to certain registers, which yeah. were the, the, the card reader input, the uh, card punch output, uh, <laughs> whatever we had in those days. Mm -hmm. And uh, each device had its own allocated shared register in real memory. Okay, that was all programmed into the GIOC. And there were three versions of the GIOC. Every every five years, they came up with a, an even better version. So that got lost completely in in the hardware business. Oh, that didn't get carried through. That did not get carried through. That is correct. And it should have. But it's like the buffer overflow solution in Multix in in '65, which never got carried through. Um, and I I, I don't, don't want to harp on that, but. Uh, Having just come back from the uh, the memorial service for Corbato, a uh, lot of discussion of, of what happened back then. I love it. That's so wonderful, government. Or maybe it's that you just came up with the best mistakes, so you know nobody can top them. So yeah. don't make new, no point making new mistakes. Okay, now there, there are other problems here, and, and sort of getting back to question. There's a lot of programming problems uh, relating to capabilities. I think uh, you've been around capabilities for many, many years. 20. 20. Uh, I, I did one in 1973, which, is, which was 40. And um, the programming problems are, are pretty nasty, but you, you want to hide that, and the, the beauty of the Cherry LLVM is that it hides all of the C, C++ stuff if you deal with with pointers properly. And uh, again, I said I don't. I'm, I'm interested in what happens if you if you try to do something with uh, with a memory safe language. You still have a lot of opportunity. Yes. So, how hard would it be to make Linux run on Cherry? And does Linus have any appetite for it? I doubt if Linus even knows what, <laughs> what we're doing. Um, I think um, some of our would-be um, uh, transition partners would do that in an instant. They would say, yeah, we've got to have Linux on it. And um, I think the fact that we're using LLVM, Cherry LLVM, would, would soften the, the difficulty. Um, there was, there is in the version seven architecture document a, um, a question that was posed, what if we put this on x86? And the, the, as Carl, <laughs> uh, you're, you're smiling. Uh, the answer is you don't want to do that. But uh, if you were, uh, there's, a, there's a lovely, uh, uh, a lovely chapter in the version 7 document by John Baldwin, who is an old uh, BS, free BSD guy, um, and who's worked uh, x86 a great deal of his consulting life. Um, and he actually detailed it in, in considerable detail. What, what would you have to do to, uh, to do a, 
uh, cherry uh, version of, uh, of x86. Um, that would also change your, your, your approach to, or Carl's approach to having Linux running on it. And, um, I, I think, again, people say, why do we use MIPS? The answer was, it's open source. And it was available. And we had, had a formal specification of, of a 32-bit version of it. It was easy to extend to 64. Um, no, I think the programming problems are things that are on our list of, of things we've got to deal with. And in fact, uh, we have done a bit in the last few years. Yeah. There, there's a lot of work being done with o OCAP languages now that JavaScript mm -hmm. is essentially object capability language. Yeah. And in particular, Salesforce, um, between Salesforce and their business partners and customers, there are 50,000 programmers writing OCAP applications. So maybe there's a, uh, a community you can learn from. Yeah. I think that's a good, good comment. OK, we have a student. So my question is about capabilities. I guess um, deriving from conventional architecture, where you have this raw pointers and every memory access is protected by um, a, a page table, uh, going from that to capabilities, it basically you place all the um, permissions distributedly um, with each pointer. And um, I, I guess I don't understand how how, how it is safer with that compared with you can have a finer, um, like finer grained um, control access with a more uh, finer grained um, page table, for example. Why do you need to just store everything distributed with pointers instead of having a centralized um, control into your memory? Okay. Uh, I mean, you're giving a talk. Well, very good. Um, interesting uh, question. One, one is you've got the typing, and, and you can't switch integers to, to pointers. You c and the other is that you can't manipulate the capability. It is, it is ironclad and non-forgeable and non-alterable and, and uh, uh, tagged. So the tags allow you to uh, have some sort of control over the flow of capabilities and, and what they can do. Um, Part of it's the programming problem, isn't it, of the, of the compiler in C, generating sloppy code that uh, all sorts of horrible things can happen to, because it's not memory safe. Uh, our stuff is is essentially memory safe. Does that make any sense? Uh, yes, I guess um, it is memory safe because you can. Um, uh, uh, have better control over a small region of memory allocated by end user program, uh, right? Uh, I mean, why, why cannot that be implemented by a better page table, which um, allows more, more, more kinds of permission control and probably over smaller regions rather than like four ki kilobyte pages. Yeah, no, and also, um, page tables are also not forgeable. Or, or changeable if you if you trust the op operating system, right? Yeah. So, so why does do you, you need to record so much redundant information with each pointer? For example, if you have a linked list, then I mean all those informations must be uh, duplicated. Well, you're, you're, you're getting into a totally different architecture. I should point out that there are as many different types of capability systems as people who have been working on them. Some, some people have got three or four of them in, in their lifetime that are different. And they're all different. Our, our capabilities are, are somewhat different from, from all the others. They don't move around a lot. They're, they're within the um, But uh, you, you, we need to, to talk offline a, a little bit more on, on that. So in order to be memory safe and not have dangling references, mm -hmm. basically don't you really need a garbage collector? Yep. And will that, okay. Yeah. okay. A and, and, and a relocating garbage collector where yeah, you can yeah, move? Yeah. There's a paper that, that was submitted on uh, Friday last week on this problem. 
it's now under review, and uh, it will someday see the light of day if it gets accepted. If not, we'll continue to revise it and, and keep submitting it until it gets accepted. But there's a, there's a, a lot of stuff on, on Cherry, it's called Cherry Revoke. Cherry Revoke, rather, sorry. And uh, V-O-K-E, v -O -K -E. Okay. Cherry, Cherry Revoke. But you won't find it online yet. Okay. But you'll be very happy when you see it. Okay. <laughs> and I'm not gonna get into details on that one at the moment. That's still in flux. Yeah. I'll be brief. Yeah. I have a comment, Peter. You asked, you posited the question, will the work that you've done on both Cherry and the um, IO attachment be adopted? My prediction is no, it will not be adopted as you have done it, but the work that you have done will be very, very influential. And I encourage you to keep socializing the work you've done because I think it's, it could be very, very helpful. That's a wonderful comment. And I, I think our relations with ARM, for example, they're, they're not going to use exactly what we give them. Um, and I think some of the other folks we're talking with uh, uh, will do the same. Um, we want to expand the number of people we're talking with. We're trying to do that, yeah. We, 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 as I say, we've got, uh, what is it, 56 papers or something like that in nine years that. Uh, well, hopefully, this, hopefully, this seminar, which will be on the web. This is wonderful. Thank you so much. And I guess that's the end of the day. Okay, thank you, people.